Namaskar everyone and uh, welcome to the Gita Satsang for today. So let us get started. I'm sorry I got a little late today. Logging in. So we'll start off immediately. Let us do the Prarthana. By the Guru's grace and the will of Sri Krishna, we have all assembled for this Gita Satsang. May we have their guidance to be able to learn and adopt the things which will help us to grow spiritually. Let us chant the prayers. Vasudeva Sutam Devam Kamsa Chanura Mardanam Devaki Paramanandam Krishnam Vande Jagat Kurum Krishna Yavasudevaya Haraye Paramatmane Pranata Klesha Nashaya Govindaya Namo Namaha Namostu te vyasa vishala buddhe, Ullara vindaya tapatra netra, Yenatvaya bharata taila purnaha, Prajvalito gnana maya pradipaha. Rama nujadaya patram gnana vairagya bhushanam, Srimad venkata natharyam vande vedanta deshikam. Yo nitya machuta padam buja yukma rukma, Vyamo hatas taditarani trinayame ne, Asmad guru bhagavato siya dayaika sindoho, Rama nujas siya charana usharanam prapadye. So with prayers at the lotus feet of the acharyas, let us uh, take up our shlokas for today. So last time we had stopped with the 16th shloka, now we are going on to the 17th shloka. Krishna is continuing to explain to Arjuna about the nature of the Atma. So in the 17th shloka it says, Avinashitu tadbiddhi yena sarvamidam tatam vinasham avyayasyasya nakashchit kartumarhati That which pervades the entire body, know it to be indestructible, indestructible. No one can cause the destruction of the imperishable soul. So here Krishna is going to explain further about the nature of the Atma. Now, the Atma is a very atomic sized or subatomic, we can say, in size. And yet, it's, it spreads all over the body. It pervades all over the body which it occupies. Now, we say that um, whenever something, if you remember what we talked about in the previous uh, shlokas, where we kind of uh, explained the differences between the Deha, the Sharira and the Atma, then we have said that the Atma is made of the nature of Jnana. So, if I experience anything in this body, then that experiencer is the Atma. Actually, the body has no Jnana. It is the Atma which has Jnana. And that is why after death, when the Atma departs, then the body is just an unconscious, unfeeling, unsensing thing, which has no life left. So this Atma, although it is so small in size and tiny and very sukshma, it pervades over the entire body which it occupies. So by saying that, that which pervades the entire body, Lord Krishna is referring to the Atma. So that is what is spreading. It has its effect all over the world. Know that to be indestructible. That means the Atma is not going to be destroyed at any time by anything. No one can cause destruction of this imperishable soul. So how do we understand this uh, idea of how the tiny Atma pervades over the entire body? The Acharyas give the example of a jasmine flower. Now we know that if there is a jasmine flower, the nature of that flower is to have a typical fragrance. Now, does that smell remain only where that flower is? No. Everywhere in the air around that flower, in the entire garden where that flower is growing, you can find the fragrance of jasmine. So similarly, although the Atma is in one place, it is said that the Atma is in the uh, heart. So that Atma 
is existing in one tiny space. It has very small dimension, which we cannot even look at. But it's, uh, what do you say, mm, nature, it's jnana, spreads all over the body, which it has occupied. So just like the da jasmine flowers, nature is to be fragrant. Similarly, the natural attribute of the Atma is to be eternal. Like there are times when we uh, talk of people around us, right? And generally after interacting for some time with some people, we come to know what is their basic nature. So we will say like, you know, about certain people, we may say, oh, that person, he is kindness itself. Now, what do you mean by saying he is kindness itself? He is a person. He is not kindness. But if there is somebody who is very kind, then we will say he is kindness itself. So that nature of that person is that. So similarly, everything has some natural attributes. Like we say, it is the natural attribute of the fire to burn or to heat up something. So whether you know and you put your hand in the fire or unknowingly you put your hand in the fire, the fire will burn because the natural attribute of the fire is to burn. Similarly, the natural attribute of water is to cool. So if you put your hand in the water, it will cool. Isn't it? Like this, being nitya, being eternal is the natural attribute of the Atma. Now, because the Atma is eternal, that means nothing can destroy it. Now, if something is going to be destroyed, then we don't call it eternal because at some point it is going to be destroyed. But only when something is never going to be destroyed, then the Acharya say that is eternal. So that is what Krishna is trying to explain here in the Gita to Arjuna. That you are worried about killing Drona. You are worried about killing Bhishma, about killing all your other relatives. Now, what you are seeing as Bhishma and Drona and all that, that Atma within that person is what is actually important. And that Atma can never be destroyed. You cannot destroy it. Anybody else also can't destroy it. So why are you feeling grief about that? Whatever you do in this fight, if you fight and they go, they get killed, then what is it actually that is killed? What is it that is destroyed? Only this particular body. And we have seen in the previous satsangs how Krishna has also explained that just like in this body, we go from childhood to young age, from young age to adulthood, from adulthood to old age. And then the body is left behind and the Atma goes further and takes on another body. So when we don't grieve for the passing away of childhood and coming of adulthood, why should we cry over the passing away of one body when the Atma is going to take another body? Isn't it? So, the Atma is eternal. You cannot destroy the Atma. So, don't grieve over the fact that you are going to kill those people. Now, uh, here the Acharya has explained a little more further about this Atma and destruction and all that. So, <coughs> we say the Atma is uh, atomic in size. Now, atomic is something that we are using to give us an idea of the scale. Actually, to even say atomic is not very correct because the way the Upanishads and the Vedas and everything describe the Atma, they say that if you take the tip of a hair and cut that one, that tip of the hair, you cut it into thousand parts and you take one part out of that thousands and you cut that into further thousand parts. That tiny size that you get is how big the Atma is or how small the Atma is. Rather. So such a tiny thing. Now, there is a normal law of science that if you want to destroy something, that something can only be destroyed by something which is smaller than that. It cannot be destroyed by an object which is bigger than that, isn't it? Like, for example, uh, if you uh, want to, um, like, like, let's say in the war and all, they fight using these guns and rifles and all that. That bullet which comes, right? That bullet which passes, it is very tiny thing, but it can destroy this big bodied person. So a small thing can destroy something big. It is very rarely that a big object will destroy something which is smaller than that. It cannot happen. You just think of any kind of a thing. If you have a big tree, that big tree can be destroyed by cutting with an axe. But if you want to cut, destroy the axe, can you use a big tree and hit it and make the axe go away? You cannot. So it's always that something which is very small only will destroy something which is bigger in size. Now, we said that this Atma is so tiny in size. There is nothing tinier than the Atma, isn't it? So, by that logic, nothing can destroy the Atma. So, that holds true. 
if there was something smaller than the atma that would have been able to destroy the atma but since there is nothing smaller than the atma it cannot be destroyed so this is one way of looking at it now further the acharyas explain that we say that inside every atma there is a paramatma isn't it it is told no the uh, upanishads and all tell that um, in the heart there is a tiny shaped paramatma who is sitting inside the atma of the um, individual so if this paramatma is tinier than the atma now by this logic which i explained just now we should say that paramatma because he is smaller than the atma is going to be capable of destroying the atma correct so that logic seems to draw us to this conclusion but then in this situation we are caught up now against the wall if we say yes because paramatma is smaller than the atma then paramatma will destroy the atma right then it makes this statement of krishna false that the atma cannot be destroyed suppose we take the other side and we say no paramatma also because we want to prove that this statement of krishna is correct that atma is indestructible we say that no no paramatma can't destroy atma then in that case we are again having a problem because we say that paramatma is sarva shaktiman he is capable of doing everything and anything in this world there is nothing which is impossible for him so if we say paramatma can't destroy the atma then we say that we are putting a limit to his powers so how is this resolved so the acharya say that it is true that the because the paramatma is tinier than the atma he can actually destroy the atma but will he destroy being able to and actually doing are two different things will paramatma destroy the atma he will never do it why because his sankalpa is to protect the atma what is the entire purpose that the lord has in his mind at the time of pralaya all these chit and achit right all the insentient matter and all the jivatmas they were um just uh, stuck to the body of the paramatma when creation happened when srishti happened then all these uh, atmas got particular bodies and what was the purpose of giving the body to that atma so that it should do sadhana so that it should get rid of its karma it should do sadhana and it should come back to the lord and stay with him in vaikuntha so if that is the aim of the paramatma why is he going to destroy the atma he will never destroy the atma so that is how the acharyas explain this part so even if we don't want to get into this kind of this argument about whether destroying atma is possible not possible what we need to understand is the atma is eternal so nothing can ever destroy the atma this is what krishna tries to explain to arjuna and again the thrust is that since the atma cannot be destroyed why are you worrying about the fact that you are going to kill the body of bishma and drona you should not grieve over that that is what krishna is trying to tell arjuna in the 18th shloka he continues further and he tries to give again you know he reiterates this in different words now why krishna is telling again and again because by repeating the same idea through different angles he is trying to impress on the mind of arjuna that you should not grieve so in the 18th shloka lord krishna says antavant ime deha nityasyokta sharirinah anashino prameyasya tasmad yuddha swabharata so we can also split and say anashino aprameyasya tasmad yuddha swabharata so he is trying to tell him now the difference again between what is the body and what is the soul so the material body which is made up of pancha mahabhutas is perishable it can be destroyed but the atma which is not made of pancha mahabhutas it is the nature of jnana itself that atma which is within that body is indestructible it cannot be destroyed it is immeasurable you cannot measure it and it is nitya it is eternal right therefore o descendant descendant of bharata you fight so again krishna is trying to convince arjuna don't worry about these material bodies of your relatives that body will anyway perish whether arjuna fights and kills them and they perish or there is some other situation in their life which causes damage to them that material body will perish at some point of time 
Arjuna should not look at the fact that the body will be killed. What he's supposed to think of that what is his duty in the what is his role in this dharma? What is his dharma? What is his right action that he has to take in this situation? Right. So here again in this shloka, the difference between atma and sharira are highlighted. We already said the body is made up of five elements. The panchama abhutas make up the body. The body has avyavas, avyavas. It has the what you say the organs. The different parts are there, and the body is destructible. It can get destroyed. Now, what is the purpose of this body then? It is just a medium. It is just the medium which is useful because that atma has to experience its baggage of karma. So, the body is meant for the purpose of experiencing our karma. Already in the previous session, we have talked about how. whatever is being experienced it is because of our uh, what you say store our baggage of papa and punya and when we experience dukha we are getting rid of our papa when we experience sukha we are getting rid of our punya so we must look upon whatever happens to this body whatever is that this body is going through as just the experience which is happening for the karmas to get over why the karmas should get over because only when the karmas are completely uh, deleted when they are completely uh, we get rid of those karmas then we get moksha and we go to vaikuntha to remain in service of the lord there so until we have karmas we have to be born again and again and that body is given to us to get rid of these karmas now the atma on the other hand so body is like this what about the atma the atma is not made of the panchama bhutas it is made only of jnana it is jnana maya it has no organs there are no parts for the atma and because of that it is indestructible only something which is something which is made of the panchama bhutas will is subject to destruction but the atma is not made of that so it is indestructible and the atma is the experiencer Now the body is the medium for experience of karma, but the atma is the one who is experiencing. So now Krishna is actually trying to convince Arjuna that you cannot kill the atma of Drona or Bhishma. So why are you grieving over their death, which will come? You do your duty of fighting without grieving and feeling sorrow that you are going to kill them, because actually you are not going to kill them, isn't it? that body will die at whatever is the time that it is supposed to die now we know how in the case of bhishma he had this um, boon which was given to him he had ichha mrityu so he could choose the time at which he wanted to depart so that way also arjuna didn't need to be bothered now for everybody there is a time which is written as per their prarabdha what is the time when they are going to die so that will happen by its own self nobody else can be responsible now of course we cannot use this as a justification to go around hurting people and say okay anyway if they are destined to die they will die not like that but now in arjuna situation when it is his duty to fight now he is shirking away from that he is running away from that duty in the name of saying that he does not want to hurt his elders so now krishna is trying to convince him that you should not think like this because the atma is eternal you cannot kill the atma ever it is only that body which is going to die so stop grieving over all this and o oh descendant of bharata you do your duty of fighting so these are the things that krishna has tried to explain to arjuna in these two shlokas now what is it that we can try and learn and try to adopt in our life we must keep reminding ourselves that the atma is eternal this body is transitory so if the body is transitory and see we don't know what all we have done in our past janmas definitely we must have done lot of punya right because of that we have got manushya janma because of that punya we have got manushya janma and because even in manushya janma there are so many people who are just living like animals we are not like that at least we have got some intelligence then we have got we have, we have, have got, had enough punya so that we get connected to people and we get satsanga we have been in families where this has been encouraged we are in the company of friends who are helping us along this path right so we have been given this now even after knowing all this 
if these are going to spend a lot of time and energy on pampering the body what is the use of having all this of having this information with us isn't it so what is it that we must do we have this deha yes now this uh, thing is told no that in the shastras it they say that sharira madhyam khalu dharma sadhanam so whatever you want to do whatever kind of work you want to do whatever uh, activity you want to do whatever sadhana you want to do also without the deha de without the sharira it is not a pos- it is not possible to do that the sharira is the madhyam through which you are going to do your sadhana so definitely yes we need to have a healthy body but beyond that we need to ask ourselves are we spending too much time and energy on activities which pamper our body anyway this body is going to get destroyed someday now please understand that you know nuance what i am talking about i am not saying that okay anyway this body is going to die someday so i will walk on the middle of the road let some gaadi come and hit me what is there if i am destined to die i will die not like that we need not do that but if i am going to uh, cry and moan over every tiny small single ache and pain and other things that i have in my body and all the time i say oh i am having this pain i am having that pain oh i have to eat this food i have to eat that food hmm? or i am going to apply this cream apply that ointment apply that lotion what is needed for enough health to maintain our body in a healthy way and assist in doing sadhana that much we must definitely do but beyond that doing what it requires to have a healthy body whether it is diet whether it is exercise whether it is lifestyle measures that we are taking we must do all that but beyond a certain point restrict the amount of time that we spend on pampering this body right and sometimes it may happen that with age there are certain changes in our body or because of some illness there are certain inadequacies that we have so we must stop crying over those things stop lamenting over those things and instead focus our attention on the sadhana that we want to do like sometimes um, it is natural that okay like um, say when you grow older then maybe you will find that you you know you get you start having back pain or leg pain or something like accept it that this is what it is it will be this body is growing old or you may lose hair fine it's okay what is there some other some day the whole body is going to go away now you have lost little hair so what way does it make any difference to your life right or let us say you find that okay you are losing weight or you are not losing weight or you are having some other you know thing where you start, don't look good or something like that as long as it is not a problem to your health and it's not uh, stopping you from doing your sadhana and other things in life in any way we must not give too much attention to all these things which affect our body so this is how we can take these shlokas and use them for our benefit so how much ever we need to do to keep our body in good shape to be able to do sadhana that much we have to do beyond that spending too much time attention energy money everything on the body is of no use because anyway some day this body is going to get destroyed when we don't know so doesn't mean that we have a fatalistic attitude and say okay anyway i'm going to die not like that keep doing what you have to do but do not pamper do not t- spend a lot of time and energy on pampering the body instead try to invest every spare moment that you have in doing namasmaran in trying to be in satsang in listening to something about god in trying to do your namasmaran more and in trying to go ahead on the marg of sadhana so i hope and pray that krishna will bless us to be able to understand these things See, it's very difficult we can talk in uh, you know in words we can say it is uh, at the intellectual level maybe somewhere we will try to uh, think about these things but when actually it comes to the crux sometimes we don't it doesn't come to us naturally but at least knowing this concept we must keep it in our head and try to at least intellectually say you know with the buddhi at least okay i will not worry over this because after all it is for the body it is not for my atma somebody shouts at me or something unpleasant happens or i have to bear some physical discomfort i will say okay fine i will bear it god has only given me this sharira so he is giving some pain also in that fine i will bear it that kind of an attitude we must try and remind ourselves about this yesterday i was listening to um, one of our acharyas who was um, you know giving a discourse so at that time he he is supposed to go on a yatra for few days and after that he will come back and start the classes again 
so while talking about that he said uh, he explained all his um, you know route and what what is the plan how long he is not going to be available to take the classes and all that and he said okay on such and such day i will come back and we will then start our things and he said uh, if, as it will happen as per guru's wish as per acharya's wish so then he further clarified he said whatever it is ultimately god has only given this body to me so he has to it is his body so i am only praying to god that you take care of this body and use it in whatever way you want to use and i thought that was such a nice a wonderful attitude for us also to cultivate that we try and keep reminding ourselves from time to time and pray to god like that that you have given me this body you take care of it for me you guide me about what i should be doing suppose somebody has some illness or some problem pray to god that you know you have given me this body so you deal with me do you help me to find the right way to deal with it when we adopt this kind of a prayerful attitude then we will find that our bhakti is becoming more so let us pray that krishna will bless us to be able to do all these things now we will offer prasadnata and stop here for today. so let us offer gratitude at the lotus feet of shri krishna and guru for inspiring us to start and join this satsang and let us pray for their blessings and grace to always be on us thank you everybody for joining in and we will meet again next thursday if you have any questions about whatever we have discussed so far or any doubts please send me a message on whatsapp thank you very much namaste